The following story is also available as a read-only version. Check the link in the description if you're interested. Snow crunched under Eric's polar boots. His heavy breath condensing in the frigid air, he trudged down the slope, following the young Russian. The night sky was alight with Aurora Borealis, projecting eerie shadows onto the white blanket covering Graham Bell Island. No wonder the Russians were seeing things that weren't real. Right here, over there, young Kostya said. He had climbed atop a cylinder of poured concrete and was pointing to a spot near the frozen shore. It would have been impossible to make out where land ended and ocean began under the ice and snow, but a projection of the island's shoreline was visible in bright red on Eric's retina. Right over here is where you saw a wolf, Eric asked. Kostya shook his head. Ghost wolf, not real wolf. It stand there and disappear, like smoke taken away by wind. Eric zoomed in on the spot by grabbing the edges of the area he wanted to see and mimicking a pulling motion. There were no paw prints, unsurprising considering that there were no wolves on this island, or anything else larger than a bird, really, and even those had left for the winter. Yes, one. Kostya insisted. Don't wolves normally hunt in packs? Eric asked. Maybe ghost wolf don't? Kostya shrugged, as though that had been an unreasonable question. Eric tapped the upper edge of his field of vision, returning it to normal. Or maybe there is no such thing as a ghost wolf. He heard the ringing of an old telephone in his ear. He held up his hand to shut Kostya up before he could respond and picked up the call. This is Osberg. The clean-shaven visage of Sigmund Lied appeared in a little window in the lower left corner of his vision. He was comfortably sitting in the corporate offices in Tromsø, a big, steaming mug sitting next to him on the desk. Hi, how are things up there? he asked. As usual, Eric responded. The Russians are superstitious, now they think they are seeing ghost wolves. Those islands do things to your mind, I tell you. Sigmund Lee took a sip from his cup, then shook his head. You should have put in for Svalbard. I like it here, Eric responded. What is it? You have an emergency landing coming in? Cargo plane. Don't want to fly into the blizzard, Lee explained. I have a ship coming in tonight. Everyone is working on unfreezing the dock. If I put them on the airfield, the Japanese will not be happy, lamented Eric. The plane is equipped for Arctic operations, Sigmund insisted. All you have to do is compress the snow. Eric shook his head. We weren't supposed to see a plane for another month. And now you'll have one landing in three hours. Isn't that exciting? Sigmund reclined in his chair. This is a very important client, and they're paying a lot for this blunder in their planning. They're going to be landing no matter what. All you have to do is make sure they do not die in the process. Eric sighed. When the Japanese are angry tomorrow, I will tell the captain that you are responsible, he decided. Feel free, Sigmund responded, smiling. Now please excuse me, I have other calls to make. Eric hung up and looked at Kostya. Come. We need to wake the night shift. There is emergency work to be done. What about Ghost Wolf? Kostya asked. Has it attacked anyone? Eric gestured to the spot where the young Russian claimed to have seen the animal. No? The young man responded. But well, then we have nothing to fear from it. Three hours later, the plane was already beginning its final descent when the last compressor rolled off the airfield. The night shift had not taken well to being woken so early, and only the promise of triple hourly pay had blunted their anger. Eric had also given them a bottle of peppermint vodka from his personal storage, which they were indulging in downstairs. He was standing in the traffic control tower, looking back and forth between the assortment of screens and the white landing strip illuminated by floodlights. Clouds had darkened the Aurora Borealis, and brought the kind of light but chaotic snowfall that was usually the harbinger of a particularly nasty blizzard. The plane set down with a trudge in the distance. 
As it approached, Eric could see that it was a beast of a machine, its unpainted hull shining like chrome, and the four air jets on each wing glowing orange with heat. Sigmund had not been joking when he said that it was optimized for arctic operations. Those things would melt in warmer climates. It rolled onto the taxiway, around the control tower, and onto the somewhat sheltered parking space of the logistics complex. It was so large that even the three-story building only reached up to half its size. The wings almost stretched over the entire lot. A hatch opened beneath the cockpit, and a ladder was dropped out of it. Two black-clad figures climbed down onto the snow-covered tarmac, shook hands with a member of the ground crew, and moved toward the building. Behind them, the latter was pulled up and the hatch closed. Jazz music was playing in the guest lounge. Posters of tropical landscapes hung on the walls and the heated floor allowed for barefoot walking. A short, blonde woman was sitting in an armchair, stretching her legs. There was no sign of the other person she had come in with. Hello, Miss Fredrik, Eric said. Her sparse visitor information displayed on his retina. She paid well, but also liked to keep her privacy, it seemed. Ah, you must be the station manager. The woman jumped to her feet, a warm smile on her face. She spoke with a refined English accent, the kind one heard almost exclusively in movies. Your colleague warned us that you would want a word. Martha Frederick, pleasure to meet you. Eric shook her hand. Edik Osberg, just here to check if everything is okay. Oh, it's really quite good. Nice place you built up here. She nodded over to the posters. Add some ocean sounds and the escapism would be complete. Some people don't like it, Eric admitted. It don't work the Arctic trade routes if you are not a fan of snow and ice. He waited for a moment, unsure of how to say what he wanted to say. There were unspoken rules and protocols for the denizens of the Arctic, and he was confused as to why the owner of this particular plane would be unfamiliar with them. So listen, we have a lot of rooms here, and it is recommended that you get the rest of your crew from the plane to spend the night in safety. Oh, everyone's here, a rough voice with a musical Irish accent declared. It belonged to a tall man with grey hair and a thick moustache. He looked to be in his fifties, but in excellent shape. Cups of tea steamed in his hands. You two pilot this plane alone? Without any extra crew, I mean? Eric asked. I pilot it, Martha Frederick informed. This is Clive O'Banion. He does logistics and security. She took one of the cups off the old man. You want some tea, Mr. Osberg? Clive O'Banion asked. It's exceptional Earl Grey. Brought it myself. No, thank you, and please do call me Eric. He gave them a smile. Well, if it is really only you two, I am sorry for interrupting, and will leave you to enjoy your time off. Oh, it's really no imposition, said Martha Frederick. And do feel free to change your mind about the tea, Clive O'Banion added. He is crazy in the head, what am I supposed to say? Vladimir said. He was the foreman of the station's night shift, and the main reason Eric had gotten them motivated to fix up the runway at all. Well, he's the fifth man to see this ghost wolf in five days, Eric explained. It has to have some meaning, maybe in Russian folklore. They were sitting in the crew kitchen. The other members of the night shift were in the adjacent mess room, singing and eating cured ham sandwiches to make sure the vodka did not get to their heads before work. Look, Russians, we are a very superstitious people, Vladimir explained. Especially the young generation, they all believe in spirits and all that shit. But why a ghost wolf? Vladimir shrugged. I'm not superstitious, how should I know? Well, there seems to be some sort of collective hallucination happening with our men here, and I want to get to the bottom of it before it turns out to be something problematic. Eric took a loaf of bread out of the box and began cutting some off. Our men! I do not recall anyone from the night shift having seen any ghost wolves, Vladimir insisted. Seems to me you should maybe tell the other four men to stick to vodka when they take something against the cold, no? 
It was the middle of the night when an urgent knock on his door dragged Eric from a dreamless sleep. You must wake! Vladimir say you must come! Kostya's voice was dulled but loud. What's wrong? Japonski ship driving to dock! Kostya sounded extremely agitated. They what? Eric asked, unsure if he had understood correctly. They drive into dock, but no slow! Crash! Kostya explained. Eric sat upright in bed. He slipped on the tactile glove on his nightstand and projected a camera feed onto his retina. I'll be out in ten seconds. The scene was even worse in person than it had been on the feed. The wedge-shaped Japanese icebreaker had lodged itself into the main pier, breaking the concrete structure in half with its reinforced black bow. There was an oblong hole in the starboard side, plastic crates and cardboard boxes spilling out of it, bobbing up and down in the freezing water. A boarding ramp had been extended onto the tilted deck, but it was entirely deserted. Vladimir was standing next to the ramp, shouting orders in Russian, barely capable of overpowering the frigid wind. His normally grey woolen jacket was almost white with snow. The blizzard was already uncomfortable, but it would get much worse before it got better. What happened? Eric shouted as he approached, Kostya and tow. Vladimir angrily gestured toward the Japanese ship. We held them on the water. They hailed back, then they break off all communication. I think bleh, something must be wrong, but they will fix it. Then I get a call from control tower. They say the ship is coming in too fast and is not decelerating. He drove his fingertips quickly toward his upheld palm. A minute later, we can see them, and they have not stopped. I call the tower again. They tell me there has been no response and no slowing down. Because I have a bad feeling, I tell the crew to get off the dock. Next thing I know, crack. Were they drifting or did they have the engines on? Eric asked. Vladimir shook his head. Engine sounded like they turned off during collision, but it is impossible to tell with this suka wind. Did you board? Eric asked. It was protocol in such situations to board as quickly as possible, in case there was an emergency on board that required assistance. Vladimir nodded, a grim look on his face. You should come see this. A minute later, Erik, Kostya and Vladimir were standing in the command bridge of the Japanese freighter. It was not elevated on a superstructure, but instead located on the gently sloping upper deck that could be accessed from the external deck. Like all of the new Japanese Arctic vessels, this one could also function as a submersible. Lying on the black linoleum floor between high-tech screens and navigational equipment were half a dozen Japanese, their faces perfect snapshots of pure horror. Their blue company uniforms were as torn as their flesh, steam rising up from their still warm blood spreading across the ground. What the hell? Eric stood at the edge of a dark pool, staring at the dead crew. What happened here? They look like they were mauled, Vladimir said matter-of-factly. Mauled by what? Were they carrying any wildlife? Eric scratched his beard. Is that even legal? Cargo manifest says computers, phones, coffee makers, graphene sheets and dried fish. Also some priority mail. I mean, what kind of animal could even do something like this? Eric asked. I don't know. Vladimir responded. A bear, maybe. Somehow a polar bear got on board? There hasn't been a polar bear sighted in three years, Eric protested. And how would it get aboard this ship? Kostya murmured softly in Russian. It was wolf. Ghost wolf, he exclaimed, crossing himself. Vladimir said something that did not sound particularly friendly in Russian, and Kostya responded his voice shaking with fear. Then he ran out, screaming. Runs like a girl, that one. Vladimir shook his head. If you best get out of here and start a proper search with weapons. If the bear is still in here, I don't want anyone else killed, Eric decided. We should probably also issue a warning for the whole complex in case it escaped, Vladimir added. Good thinking, Eric said, 
trying not to think about the fact that he might be ordering the death of the very last polar bear on Earth. Inside the base, things were tense. Though there were only a few people still up, mostly Russian station crew drinking vodka at the bar, Kostya seemed to have ignited an oil field. All except for the hardy men of Vladimir's night shift looked terrified even if they tried to hide it. They actually believed that a ghostly wolf was roaming the island. A polar bear was bad enough, there was no need to add the supernatural to the mix. Erik picked six men from the night shift, Vladimir included, and led them downstairs into the storage basement. Thin sheets of fern lay on the concrete floor of the hallway, their breath condensed in the air. It was the kind of wet, inclement cold that penetrated to the bone in a way not even a blizzard could. They stepped through a puddle as they walked past the heat pumping station, and finally arrived at a heavy door decorated with warning signs. Eric typed a six-digit code and pressed his thumb on the print scanner. An off-tone klaxon resounded, and the door opened automatically. Inside were enough weapons and protective gear to outfit a small platoon. Most were relics from decades ago, when the ice-cold war had been in danger of heating up at all times, and every nation with Arctic interests was ready to defend their assets at a moment's notice. The Treaty of Auckland had put an end to that, but the weapons remained. Erik handed out compact assault rifles, Kevlar vests, and protectors for arms and shins. All of the equipment was adapted for use in the coldest of conditions. The guns had battery-heated barrels that could never freeze over, and the protective gear had latches wide enough to be strapped over a dozen layers of clothing. Everyone with a retinal screen had software that could block out the noise of heavy snowfall, and they synced their feeds to the night and heat vision attachments of their rifles. When the group came back upstairs, Clive O'Banion was standing by the basement door. He was wearing a black sweater and cargo pants, and a hunting knife was strapped to his belt. Despite the late hour, there was no hint of drowsiness in his eyes. It said employees only, so I thought I'd wait here, he said, pointing at the sign next to the basement stairwell. Clive, I am sorry, but right now is really not a good time, Eric apologized. You should go to your room and lock the door. The Irishman grinned. I heard. Ursus Maritimus, eh? I might be able to help with that. Eric shook his head. Please, you are a paying customer and it is my job to keep you safe from any potential danger. Nonsense. We're all stuck on this station together, Eric. That means we all need to work together, too. He tapped his hunting knife. Twenty years ago, I was working with a team of scientists tasked with tagging and extracting DNA samples from all remaining polar bear specimens in case they went extinct. It was dangerous work, but I can proudly declare myself to be somewhat of an expert on this particular creature. Eric considered his options for a moment. Clive looked competent enough, and he remembered reading something about an operation like this in his high school newspaper. It was common practice to this day to catalogue the DNA of disappearing species and store it in various gene vaults, so they could be resurrected in the future in case of total extinction. All right, follow me, I'll give you weapons and armour. No need, I have my own. He pointed upward. What kind of drones do you have? Drones do not fly in these weather conditions, Vladimir interjected. You don't have the right kind of drones, then. Clive laughed as though this situation was in any way amusing. Luckily for you, I do. Even in the storm, the ladder to Martha Frederick's plane was surprisingly easy to climb. There had to be some hydraulic system in it, as it seemed unimpressed by the wind and the weight of the three men holding onto it. Clive led Eric and Vladimir into a small cabin, where the ladder was attached to a roll-up winch. A winding stairwell led upstairs into a roomy cockpit and radar room. Though the equipment was state-of-the-art, everything was encased in chrome and wood, with leather seats and ancient lamps. If he hadn't known any better, Eric would have considered this a set for some kind of 1950s revival adventuring film. Don't touch that door, please, Clive warned, not looking up from the console he was manning. It is actually dangerous. 
Vladimir was standing next to a heavily secured compartment door. Eric counted a whopping six latches and three separate locks. What is behind it? Vladimir asked. Paying customer stuff. Clive spoke with humor, but insistently. Before Eric could feel uncomfortable with the situation, a slight rumble went through the plane, and six video feeds appeared on a formerly black screen above Clive's head. I'll be sending an integration request to your control tower so they can keep an eye on things, the Irishman replied. Should make the search a lot easier. Through the feeds, Eric could see the drones hovering above the plane. They were heavy, battleship grey beasts of burden, probably larger than he was, and held upright by six propellers with blades the size of his leg. Clive opened a locker next to the secured door and began putting on his own gear. It was far beyond anything Eric had in the weapons locker. A full-body Arctic operations combat suit, Kevlar and graphene woven into its padding. The snow camo pattern shifted slowly around it in a seemingly random fashion, and Eric suspected it was capable of much more than that. What are you, some kind of mercenary? Vladimir asked, a frown the size of Galthöppingen on his forehead. Clive put on snow goggles, smiling. Used to be the good kind. A green light flashed in the corner of the goggles. They were obviously high-tech, equipped with all number of functions and resolutions that Eric did not even want to think about. The Irishman put on a white beanie and pulled up his collar. Shall we? Rationally, he could have sworn that it was only the wind, but Eric was sure that there had been an excited rattling on the other side of the door. There was no bear to be found on the Japanese freighter, only more dead crew. One had been mauled as he walked down a hallway, two others in their bunks, and another in the bathroom. The various cargo holds were full to the brim, with no space for storage of any large critters. Eric could not imagine a reason why anyone would want to smuggle a polar bear through the Arctic, and the fact that the world had not gone entirely mad gave him some peace of mind. It did, however, mean that the polar bear was somewhere on Graham Bell Island, and that caused all kind of concern. This bear is quite the surgeon, said Clive O'Banion. He seemed remarkably light-hearted in the face of the scenery. How do you mean? Eric asked. There's no paw prints anywhere. With these pools of blood, you would expect at least a few. These cuts are eerily precise. It went straight through the neck, and then just left the bodies. Clive knelt down to the Japanese crewman lying on the bathroom floor. His jaw had been torn off, and his head was holding onto his body only by the spine. Must have been a young bear too. There is no good dental profile on these corpses, but the mouth is small for a polar bear. Please do not say wolf, I will shoot you in the face, Vladimir warned. Clive laughed. Don't be so confident you could pull the trigger faster than I could disarm you, mate. Now that you say it, though, this may well have been an arctic wolf. There are no wolves in Franz Josef land, least of all Graham Bell Island, Eric protested. Have you been listening to the Russian sailors, Clive? I'm afraid I don't even speak Russian, Eric, Clive responded. Some of us are very good at English, Vladimir noted. What do you find more difficult to believe? That a giant, not to mention extinct bear, climbed into this ship and killed everybody with surgical precision, or that a slim and cunning wolf, which has been seeing recovering populations throughout Siberia, did it? Asked Clive. If you put it like that, Eric conceded. But still, how would it have gotten here? And why would it be alone? And why would there be no paw prints? Clive shrugged. I don't know, but we'll have to find out, won't we? In accordance with the evidence, and a general lack of bear paw prints discovered by Clive's drones, which still seemed unimpressed by the increasingly violent blizzard, Eric lowered the alarm level slightly. To his irritation, the Russians found the idea of a wolf scarier than that of any polar bear, especially considering that there had been no wolf prints either, which Eric attributed to the fact that they would have been much smaller and more difficult to detect, possibly even filled with fresh snow shortly after they were made. However, at this point, 
even the night shift was convinced of the existence of a ghost wolf. An armed perimeter had been required for the workers to place graphene-lined cushions underneath the Japanese freighter and secure it to the dock. It was now no longer sinking and could not be dragged out by wind or tide, but would remain there until summer when it could be safely salvaged. So far, the Russians had refused to touch the bodies. If this persisted, Erik and Vladimir would have to move them into storage themselves. It was not about protecting them from the elements, but basic human dignity. The blizzard had remained consistently annoying, but not too dangerous. According to the weather center on Svalbard, this was about to change. They had been ordered to bunker down and get ready for a bad storm hitting them very soon. No emergency rescue operations could be mounted under these conditions. The shutters of all windows had been closed, even the armored ones at the control tower, and leaving the safety of the base interior required authorization by a foreman for the crew and Erik himself for everyone else. He was finishing up his report for Sigmund Lied when Martha Frederick knocked on the door of his office. Ah, Martha, Erik smiled. Are you here for your drones? I imagine you'd want them safely back aboard your plane before the brunt of the blizzard hits. She shook her head, waving his words away. Nonsense. Those deers can take much worse, and when the blizzard does become too much, they will descend and hunker down in the snow until conditions are clearer. I designed them myself, so I am confident that they will work. Felt we certainly appreciate them. They are very helpful for seeing dangerous weather approaching. Eric pushed aside the keyboard. What can I do for you? Martha sat down in a chair, giving him a sharp, critical gaze. After a moment, she said, I'm here to talk about your wolf problem. There is really not much we can do about it at this point in time, I am afraid. Eric was not about to put his crew in danger. When the blizzard clears, we will search. Until then, it is not going anywhere. Frankly, I expect it to die in the storm. Martha Frederick shook her head. When the blizzard clears, everyone in this station will be dead. Excuse me? Tell me, Eric, have you, or the people who work for you, seen anything strange over the past few days? Martha asked. Apparitions? Sounds? Sudden onset paranoia, maybe? Are you messing with me? Eric asked. Quite the opposite. Clive was messing with you when he played games instead of being upfront about what is really going on here, and it's not a quality I appreciate in him. She slapped the armrests of her chair. I've already talked to your crewmen and what they describe as unanimous. You're dealing with the Lupus Spectre, an individual for the moment. What do you mean, for the moment? Eric asked. And what the hell is a Lupus Spectre? The woman sounded as crazy as Kostya. Lupus Spectres live inside blizzards. What your men saw was an outrider, a scout for the pack. He will already have made his report to the Alpha. When the blizzard arrives, they will descend upon the station and feast like kings. Martha explained, keeping a straight face through all of it. You're not joking, are you? You really believe this? Eric leaned back in his chair, stroking his beard. As much as I love comedy, this is no joking matter. Lupus spectres are dangerous creatures. The few cultures that have historically resided beyond the Arctic Circle know to fear the wolf as a harbinger of death, but we Westerners have only begun setting up shop here recently, and while blizzards were once extremely rare around these parts, now they are a frequent occurrence. You're talking about wolves living inside of a storm, Eric frowned. That is crazy. Martha shook her head. Not wolves, spectres. They only look like wolves. Do not underestimate their intelligence. They may be primal beings without much in the way of sapiens, but they are just as clever as humans. That makes it sound even less believable, Eric noted. Martha sighed. I seem to have misjudged you. You're not quite as sceptical a mind as I had hoped. I am very sceptical, especially of the supernatural. Eric could not help but feel a little offended. You've seen what the Lupus Spectre did to the crew of the Japanese vessel. Can you really believe that an actual wolf somehow found its solitary way up here from Arkhangelsk, over the unreliable ice, snuck aboard that ship and killed everyone strategically? 
Martha tapped on the armrest. The Japanese rely on their transarctic shipping routes remaining open all year, no matter what happens. That is why their ships are hermetically sealed submersibles. You may remember this, but some years ago a Japanese freighter was en route to Dublin when Faroese pirates boarded it. Or at least they tried. Eric nodded. He had indeed read about this in the news. They could not get inside the ship and remained stuck on the exterior deck. Lockpicks, blow torches, even explosives could do nothing but scratch the paint. The captain never even had to activate any special lockdown protocols. Eventually, the pirates gave up and left. What does this have to do with our situation? Eric asked. Do you not see? Only a being that is entirely unimpaired by walls could enter a Japanese freighter while it is in motion. And the walls of this base will not keep out it or its pack either. But why kill the Japanese sailors? They were going to stay at the base anyway. It could have done this later. Vladimir said they were communicating just minutes before the crash, Eric pointed out. Martha sighed again. These are alien beings, Eric. I do not proclaim to have a full understanding of their psychology, but this is in line with how they have operated in the past. I have empathy with the idea that the questioning of your rationalistic worldview is making you reach for straws, but now is neither the time nor the place. Why did it not attack you then? Eric was feeling a strange mix of amusement and fear that what this woman was saying might actually be correct. They live in blizzards. They can clearly fly. A plane is not penetrable to them, and the scout would not have risked an attack so close to the base, Martha explained. I know this sounds crazy and you do not believe me, but it is imperative that you at least trust me. So we put everyone on the plane, yes? Eric was angry. Then you lock us in there, take over the base, and demand a ransom from the company. Martha took a deep breath, frustration clear on her face. The plane does not have enough space for everyone, not even close. It's large, but also quite full. Eric paused. That put a hole in his theory, which had already failed to explain the deaths on the Japanese ship. Say I believed you, which I do not, but if I did, what would you want me to do? An hour later, Eric was outside, wrapped in six layers of his thickest clothes. The blizzard had gone from grey seal to killer whale faster than he'd ever seen, and the frigid wind bombarded him with splinters of ice through the tiniest cracks in his armour. Bending against the storm, Clive was ramming the last of six metal and plastic poles into the snow. Following right behind him, Martha was running three copper wires between the new pole and the last one. They formed a cage around Eric that was roughly the size of his office, and could easily be escaped by slipping through the wires. The side between the two poles that faced away from the base remained open. And this will hold it? Eric asked. He was unwilling to admit to himself that he did believe Martha at least a little bit. The things that had transpired were just too weird to be normal. I don't know, we've never done this before, Clive responded. The blizzard was too loud to allow for anything but shouting matches, so his voice was relayed through the speakers in Eric's ear warmers. We have done this before and it does work, Martha reassured him. Clive cackled quietly as he knelt down to stabilize the pole with a snow pile. As terrifying as they are, spectres are easily frightened. That's why most kinds no longer exist. Humans drove them to extinction. Martha fastened the wires to the pole with quick, practiced movements. The gloves seemed to be no hindrance at all. If we manage to kill their scout, the rest of the pack will avoid this place like a leper colony. But if they are so intelligent, will they not see this trap for what it is? Eric asked. They may be intelligent, but they are still driven by instinct, Clive explained. We just need to give the scout something that is irresistible. You're planning to use me as bait. Eric had known from the beginning. If someone was needed in that role, it would have to be him. He was the manager of the station, and it was his job to protect the crew and guests. He would have allowed no other volunteers. It's going to be a little more difficult than standing around in here. 
Martha began running a wire from the top of the final pole across the cage to the one opposite it. I assume you know how to move through a blizzard relatively safely? The best way to do that is by staying inside, Eric said dryly. Clive laughed. You're getting the hang of this. As Martha continued wiring up the top of the cage, Clive produced a black bag from inside his coat. Without warning, he popped it open and threw the contents at Eric. A dark liquid that smelled of iron drenched his jacket, and it took him a moment to realize what it was. The smell of human blood will drive the Looper Spectre mad, Clive explained. This is human blood! Eric was terrified and disgusted at the same time. Don't worry, it's mine, said Martha. Steam was rising from the black patches on Eric's jacket. He stared down at it, unable to think. That thing will kill me, he finally decided. Don't think about it too much, that'll just make you afraid. Clive threw him a blue cone of plastic the size of a small water bottle. All you have to do is run fast and use this when it comes too close. What is it? A sound gun, Martha explained. Think of it as an anti-dog whistle. Remember to point it directly at the spectre's head, Clive added. In this weather, the sound waves will be weakened. I am liking this less and less, said Eric, standing still in befuddlement. As I said, don't think about it too much. You might get cold feet. Clive patted him on the shoulder. This will be an adventure. Behind all the hats, goggles and masks, it was impossible to tell, but Eric could have sworn that Clive was smiling like a little boy on the morning of his birthday. Even the white of snow, ice and bright clouds before the aurora could not stop the creeping darkness. It was not too bad outside of the base, but Eric had been wandering away from it for twenty minutes, and its bright lights were fading away in the blizzard. Martha had spotted the ghost wolf through one of the drone's camera feeds, and sent him off wandering in that direction. Clive had stressed that time was running out, and the rest of the pack would be arriving soon. Eric was not entirely sure how to make himself look extra tasty, and he was also not sure if he wanted to. There was a flicker before his eyes, a gust of white flakes twisting and twirling in the wind. It disappeared almost immediately, but it confirmed his suspicions. The blizzard was interfering with the wireless coverage, and if his retinal screens could not communicate with his office computer, the denoising algorithm would lack the processing power required to do its job. He cursed himself for not having installed more routers over the island, assuming that nobody would be walking about in such extreme weather anyway. It was important to keep moving. His many layers kept him reasonably warm, but standing still even for a moment while treading shin-high snow and fighting against the winds tugging at him could make it more difficult to start walking again. Besides, his body heat and the permanent snowfall might make the snow around him melt and turn to ice. If the Looper Spectre decided to attack then, it would take valuable tenths of a second to pull free, and he might not have those. Another flicker. The snow had almost become a wall of white. Eric decided not to walk out further, and took a few steps in the direction of the base. The snow returned, clogging his field of vision for several heartbeats. When it faded away, a shadow was jumping at him. It was a wolf, not so much made of shadow as it was darkness. The contrast was enough to make it visible, but some translucency remained. The Looper Spectre was no bigger than a regular arctic wolf. Its fur was shaggier, trailing off like smoke as the creature flew toward him. The eyes staring at Eric with murderous hunger were so utterly black they seemed to glow. He jumped backward, stumbling in the dense snow. The Looper Spectre was standing over him, its cold breath sucking every last bit of warmth out of his face. In a panic, Eric used the sound gun in his hand. His heart was racing so fast it felt like his chest was about to explode. The Looper Spectre made no sound, but its dark form shivered and then vanished, carried away by the wind. Eric pulled himself up faster than he would have thought possible and ran toward the lights of the base. Heavy clouds of breath condensed in the air before him. The snow flickered and flickered again. 
Sprinting with long, powerful strides, the adrenaline coursing through his bloodstream like boiling water through a dense pipe, he looked back and saw the beast again. It prowled after him, paws sinking into the snow but leaving no prints. Somehow, the lupus spectre broadcast its internal conflict of hungry craving and fear of the sound gun. Eric didn't care. He just wanted it gone. With a primal scream of fear, he aimed the gun at the spectre and pulled the trigger. It stopped dead in its tracks, watching him as he kept on running away. Eric did not take his eyes off the beast until it finally faded away again, and he turned his gaze forward, not stopping for a moment. Eventually, when the lights of the station had become brighter and the flickering of snow ceased, sense returned to Eric's mind. He slowed down, coming to a halt on a small outcropping of rock. His lungs hurt like they were freezing and on fire at the same time. His heart hammered incessantly and his legs began to shudder. He had shaken the lupus spectre. That was bad. That meant he would die and so would everyone else on the station. He needed to get back out there, have the creature get his scent again, drive it wild with hunger. But what if it was too afraid of the sound gun? What if it had figured out that he was bait? What if he had already messed everything up? Billiard, Eric, you mudak! Not three meters away, a large figure in a grey coat was stomping toward him. Pashal nachu, you complete idiot! Vladimir, what are you doing here? Eric asked. Nobody was supposed to be out here but him. Because I am looking for you, isn't that obvious? Vladimir gestured about. What the fuck are you thinking? It really is difficult to explain. He had instructed everyone to remain inside the base while he, Martha and Clive took care of business outside. Suka, Bliet. Those fucking Brits made you believe their bullshit. And now you are out here killing yourself in a snowstorm. Vladimir hit the side of his head. How stupid are you? I realize this may seem crazy, but... Eric began. I talked to the men. This Frederick woman asked them about this ghost wolf business, and now suddenly you act like fucking Kostya Karpinski. Except suicidal. Even under all the layers, it was easy to see that Vladimir was shaking his head. He had them barricade the entrances. Whatever the Brits are planning, they will not do it just because you decided to sell your brain to some gopnik. No, listen, Vladimir, this thing is real. I have seen it. Suka, Bilet, stop it. He raised a hand as though he wanted to slap Eric in the face. When we get back, I will call Sigmund Lid and have you sent to Norway for a fucking psychological examination. I cannot. He never finished the sentence. A shadow materialized in mid-flight, slamming into Vladimir and wrestling him to the ground. No! shouted Eric, and jumped down from the rock, fiddling with the sound gun. Vladimir cursed as he punched at the lupus spectre. The beast sunk its teeth into his neck. Eric pulled the trigger, held it down as he shot waves of agonizing sound at the ghost wolf. The creature jerked back, snarling soundlessly and dashed away. What the fuck was that? Vladimir shouted. Suka! Eric ran over to help him. The Russian was holding his neck and breathing heavily. That was the ghost wolf, Eric explained. I don't know how, but it's real, and I am baiting it. Are you all right? I think, Vladimir managed, his hand still firmly on his neck. Hurts like shit, though. The heavy winter clothing seemed to have prevented the worst. We need to get out of here. Eric looked around nervously. Can you walk? Vladimir did not respond, but began marching forward toward the base. Eric followed him, scanning the perimeter for the lupus spectre. He would have to return later when Vladimir was safe to play bait again. He could not risk one of his crew to die. They did not get very far. After only a few steps, the lupus spectre slammed into Eric Ripping away parts of the outer jacket of his arm, he fell and the sound gun slipped out of his hands. No! Before he was even fully down, he looked for it frantically. A gust of wind above him and a thump that slammed Vladimir to the ground. He shouted in anger and fear. Eric dug around the spot where he believed the sound gun had landed but came up empty-handed. 
Vladimir's screams turned to gargles. Eric looked over as the ghost wolf was goring the throat of his friend, dark blood spurting onto the white snow. The sound gun was forgotten, and a realization of his failure appeared on the horizon. Then, the beast looked at him with its pitch black eyes, and instinct took over. Eric darted upward, sprinting at a speed he would never have thought possible, trudging through the heavy snow with the strength of a bear, burning reserves of energy he did not know he had. There was pressure on his calf, something pulled it backward. There was a rip and sudden cold. Eric did not have to look back to know that the Lupus Spectre had torn away most layers of clothes down there. He ran, barely considering direction, not thinking about what had happened, or if he even had a chance to escape. All he knew was that if he stopped, he was dead, and dead was something he did not want to be. He turned a corner, around a small hill. A mesh of wires appeared before him, fastened to a hexagon of metal poles. Some part of his mind knew he had to run in there, and then he would be safe. Gusts of impossibly frigid air hit his thigh every time the spectre snapped at it. Eric got into the final sprint. He had to enter that cage through the open side, had to get in there to be safe, to get away from the monster that was chasing him. As he dashed past the poles, he stumbled and flew forward, landing face down in the compressed snow, slithering on the thin sheet of ice that had formed there. There was a click behind him, and when he turned around frantically, he saw that Martha, little more than a white shadow in her high-tech gear, had closed the cage behind the ghost wolf. The ghost wolf, which was now standing right at Eric's feet, showing its teeth in a victorious grin. There was a slight hum as an electric current ran through the wires of the cage, and the lupus spectre looked around, seemingly irritated. Eric's blood froze. This was not safety at all. He was stuck in here, with a beast, and it would kill him. There was an explosion in the snow next to him. A humanoid shape emerged from beneath a cover of white like a wengeful demon. It had a long knife in its hand. The blade seemed to glow bright blue on its own. The lupus specter began circling, stepping over Eric's legs as though they weren't there. Its eyes fixed on Clive who mirrored the wolf's movements in a low stance, twirling the glowing knife in his hand. There was growling, and it took Eric a moment to realize that it was not coming from the lupus spectre. The beast and Clive jumped at the same time. They lunged toward each other, jaw open and blade swinging. At the last possible moment, Clive pulled back and held out his arm toward the ghost wolf. It bit down on it, so hard the Irishman let out a grunt of pain. Then he drove his knife into the creature's belly and sliced it open like it was made of butter. The pathetic wince the lupus spectre gave did not make a sound, but Eric could feel it reverberate in the deepest recesses of his soul. Out of the darkness, faint liquid light seemed to flow from the cut on the beast's belly, dissipating before it even touched the ground. The creature deflated in a matter of seconds the strong jaws sliding off Clive's arm. A small glowing pool formed on the ground, but disappeared as soon as it was formed. When all the light had left the Lupus Spectre, its body simply faded away like a shadow in the light. Let's get inside and wait out the storm, said Clive. I need a drink. Five days later, the skies had cleared and Vladimir's body had been found. Some of the workers were recovering the Japanese sailors from their vessel to be stored in an empty cooling room. Eric was standing at the foot of Martha Frederick's plane, the Aurora Borealis shown mystically off its perfectly reflective hull. And what am I supposed to tell them? The very same scepticism you showed me will play to your advantage here, Martha said. She had one hand already on the ladder. Just say you don't know what happened, and when you went out to find Vladimir, you found him like that. They'll have about as much of an idea as you could possibly ever have. Though I would put money on them going with the polar bear theory, Clive added. He was drinking tea from a thermos flask. They'll be clueless, but they won't blame you for what happened. What about you? Eric asked. A mysterious arrival and departure would not go unnoticed in any reports. 
We pay your company enough not to ask questions, and if they do, we will know how to answer, Martha reassured him. What you really should not do is go around and tell people about lupus spectres. That will land you in a mental health institution faster than you can say unfit for duty. Eric nodded, unsure what to say. Thank you, I suppose. Clive patted him on the shoulder. Don't thank us, thank yourself. You acted like a bloody damn hero. Don't worry about us, Eric, Martha added. Take care. Before he could respond, she began climbing the ladder, and Clive followed only a few rungs behind. Eric stood there wordlessly until they were both inside, and the ladder had begun retracting. They won't be able to take C of A if you stand there, Eric, the control tower said into his earpiece. Eric nodded and trudged away. He had a post-emergency damage report to compile. If you liked this story and would like to hear more, please do subscribe to the YouTube channel. A new short story is uploaded every Wednesday, and there will occasionally be another one in between if I find the time. Thank you very much for listening and have a great day.